So I'd like to introduce um, uh, Lauren Ferguson, um, who is currently a, a postdoc at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, working on the Harvard Healthy Buildings Program. Um, she just moved there a week and a half ago, and um, she is. it is now seven o'clock uh, in the morning for her, so she's going above and beyond. Thank you for that, Lauren. Um, <laughs> before that, she was a, a research fellow at the UCL Institute for Environmental Design and Engineering, where she worked together with Bayes on projecting future temperatures across UK housing under a warming climate. And she also did her PhD at um, UCL. Um, so today um, she's gonna be talking to us about modeling population exposure to indoor air pollution and heat. Looking forward to it, Lauren, the floor is yours. Thanks, Martin. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Lauren, and today I'm going to be talking about modeling indoor air pollution and heat but at the at the population level. And this is some work that I did during my PhD at UCL, which was co-funded by the UK Health Security Agency, um, and then a, a little bit after during my kind of first research project out of my PhD at UCL. Uh, but I've since, as Martin said, I've since moved to the US. Um, so yeah, I haven't got any Wi-Fi, so apologies if there's any um, connection issues. Uh, can I have the next slide, please, Katie? Thank you. Um, so a quick background is that the UK built environment is currently facing a number of challenges. For example, some being that there was an estimated 50 million households in fuel poverty last winter. We have increasing summertime temperatures, um, such as the 40 degrees in summer 2022. And we have ambient air pollution concentrations, which sometimes breach national and international guideline limits. Uh, we generally spend a lot of our time indoors. Um, it can be up to 95% for some population groups. So our exposure to external temperatures and ambient air pollution concentrations will be modified by buildings. And there are a number of building and environmental features which might exacerbate non-optimal temperatures and air pollution concentrations in the indoor environment and that are more commonly features of vulnerable homes. Things like living in smaller homes with reduced background ventilation and living in urban areas within the urban heat island where ambient temperatures and air pollution concentrations are higher. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and the government plans to introduce uh, a number of different retrofit initiatives, or, well, they, they said they would originally, um, to bring the housing stock within national decarbonisation targets, uh, reduce space heating demand and tackle the rise in fuel poverty rates. But summertime overheating is becoming an issue that is sometimes more commonly observed in energy efficient housing. And this is along with elevated levels of indoor sourced air pollution. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about less so on the different policies, but ways that you can <clears throat> evaluate these kind of policies on the population or across the building stock. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about two uh, different models. So the first one on the left is like a personal exposure model, um, which a quick overview, it kind of takes a, a nationally representative building survey, so the EHS, and it plugs these kind of building characteristics into Energy Plus, which is a whole building energy thermal um, simulation tool. And then the, <clears throat> excuse me, the resultant, you can weight the resultant out. So you have these Energy Plus results for different, for a representative sample of buildings, and you can link them back to the survey surveyed individuals and weight them and you get like a representative sample of so in this case it was 1.3 million children in greater london and their kind of typical exposure 
and that's so that's like a, a building physics model using energy plus that's been weighted um for different weighted to get a to scale it up at the regional level uh the second model overview on the right this is this is an indoor heat model so it again uses energy plus and you take inputs in the same form that you did in the personal exposure model run them in energy plus and then train a meta model framework on the inputs and outputs that's kind of what this diagram across the top is trying to um show and that that meta model framework so it uses a random forest model so it's, it's a statistical model that's derived from building physics simulations and then you've run a data set a spatially mapped data set with the same input that you train the model on and you end up with a sample of around 17.5 million UK dwellings um, and I'll go into more detail on these individual models so uh, yeah next slide please so the personal exposure model so it has a number of it models concentrations in indoor and outdoor microenvironments so it has a number of different components um, the first domestic component so uh, we used archetype based stock model so we have eight archetypes that were not developed by me that were previously developed at UCL uh, Institute for Environmental Design and Engineering um, so these are like broadly representative of the English stock so they they represent about um, 75% of the English stock and you can scale these archetypes so you can scale the size um, you can scale the kind of building fabric and we take these the values from which to scale each of the archetypes from um, this energy plus next slide please thank you so uh, sorry we take these values by which to scale each archetype from the English housing survey which is the nationally representative housing survey, which surveys um, surveys a, a population, and so you can get estimates of a representative population and the kind of homes that they live in. Um, it's kind of it's undergone a cost review for the, over the last decade, so it's not it's not as kind of rich as it once was. But we put all this info into Energy Plus. So I think in, in my case, I had about 2,000 individual dwellings that I simulated in Energy Plus. And then I would weight them by the survey weight reported in the English Housing Survey. And that then scaled the scaled the results up to the regional level. So for, for Greater London. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the non-domestic component was kind of simplified a bit compared to, well, yeah, definitely simplified compared to the domestic components. So because we didn't have a um, reliable database of uh, building character characteristics in non-domestic environments, I constructed a distribution of air change rates for different environments and then plug them into a mass balance approach so this we, we take a distribution where we haven't got where there's a lot of uncertainty about the underlying building characteristics we try and use a value from a distribution to try and account for some of that uncertainty um, and we model indoor concentrations in non-domestic environments as a function of the outdoor concentration, which is assigned again using a distribution um, based on information reported in the EHS. So they're just so I think the only indoor source in the non-domestic environment was resuspension for a given number of occupants. So um, this actually led to quite high indoor concentrations in the classroom. Um, which was kind of interesting. So then you have these different 
indoor and outdoor concentrations in different microenvironments. And then they were weighted by time activity information. So where, so this is from, this graph is from uh, the NatSent, the 2015 NatSent time use survey. And it shows the proportion of the child population on, on the Y um, in the different microenvironments throughout the day. So the blue peak is when they're at school and you can see that that's present in the weekdays but not really in the weekends um the orange is like when they're in bed is this the uh, next slide katie Anne? oh sorry yeah, yeah sorry this i forgot to say i'll start again um so we have these concentrations in non-domestic and domestic microenvironments and we then weight them by this time activity information. So this is from the NatSend time use, the 2014 to 2015 NatSend time use survey. And it shows the proportion of the child population on the Y that are in different um, indoor and outdoor microenvironments um, throughout different times of the day. Um, so you can see the blue peak is like when they report they're at school so it's quite significant on weekdays but not not so on, on weekends um so the this uh these values we used to wait so you'd match up each micro environment at the equivalent time stamp and then weight them weight the indoor concentrations by the proportion of the population that were in that that reported they were in that um microenvironment at that same time um, next slide please so the results are you get distributions of personal exposure by so in the EHS the, you have different kind of sociodemographic information on each kind of household so it was possible to look at how um exposure can vary for different kind of in in this case we looked at household income quintile but you can look at how it varies by age or uh gender so yeah next slide please so this is probably a better figure so we look at we found that it we looked at how children from the different five different income groups how their exposure varied and we generally found that children from lower income groups this is like the, the darkest red on the the bottom bar chart on each of the figures um they they have the highest exposure but it wasn't always linear and in general children school children in greater london all had quite bad like 60 percent breach like just less than 60 percent Reached the 24 hour guideline limit set by the World Health Organization. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so to summarize that model, uh, children from the lower income groups fared worse, but the relationship wasn't always linear. And 57% had a personal exposure model which exceeded the 24 hour guideline limit set by the WHO. We found that residential and indoor sources of PM2.5 were a large contributor to personal exposure for school children in London. Um, I didn't include it here, but the the time activity data have shown that they were at the home for 68%, on average 68% and 8% of their time on weekdays and weekends. So their personal exposure was shaped a lot by like the... Um, indoor concentrations in the home and the tool can be used to assess a number of hard so so changes to the building start or soft sort of changes in behavior policy interventions and assess their impact on childhood exposure to air pollution um next slide please so now i'm going to talk about uh the second model so this is a statistical model um yeah, that's derived from Energy Plus, but it uses, yeah, a different kind of method. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So it's it's 
a yeah it's a statistical model that's it's basically um it's trained on energy plus so you have all these energy plus inputs kind of what i talked about before so you have fixed dwelling types that there's eight archetypes that are broadly representative of the stock but you have different values for each archetype they're scaled in the previous case they were scaled according to the ehs <clears throat> The English Housing Survey, this this nationally representative survey, in um in this the so the the numerical values are kind of sampled from a, a random distribution, um which is defined according to kind of in, like wider empirical data, and and so then you generate these different um different energy plus input files, which is it's just like a text file basically with like all of these different kind of random random variables and you run them in energy plus and you generate some outputs uh for we looked at energy as well so we had we had some temperature metrics overheating metrics and then different heating and energy use um next slide please this just kind of gives a bit of a better idea of the framework so you have these basically input csvs with the with values generated from a distribution so you can see there the permeabilities are all quite random um for fixed building and, and wall types <clears throat> and you generate you batch generate these energy plus idfs so these are like the the text files that run in energy plus and then batch simulate them on UCL's kind of supercomputer and then you generate kind of aggregated results for each kind of each energy plus input file that you've you've generated and then you train it's basically like a fancy regression so you match up the two c out the input and output csvs by row like row number and you fit kind of a random forest to each of those uh next next slide please and then we so then you have this kind of trained meta model that needs to take that to predict the outputs that i just shown there you have to take inputs that are the same as what the model was trained on so uh for that we use the energy performance certificate register which is spatially mapped data so this is how many um dwellings we got in the end uh we had so we had 17.5 million uk dwellings you can see that the blue color means the, the uh, local authorities had quite a high percent of dwellings with a epc the kind of ready orange mean they didn't so you can see that england is more um better is is generally better represented but some of the rural areas are less so, as you probably expect, where there's less residential mobility. Um, there are a number of issues with EPCs. They're, they're not always um, accurate. Uh, but we use them because the fact you can get dwellings at like an individual address level. Um, so this was kind of an appeal for us, so this this research was funded by uh, Bayes at the time, the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, um, and they wanted to like have a tool where you could really target um, interventions and see how they would how they would affect the population, like where they were best better target interventions. Um, next slide, please. So I'm not allowed to share any of the results from this just yet. It's still under review, but this is an example output um, that was of kind of interest to me. So this is not, this is, I just got this off Google, but this is kind of what the outputs are to look like. And where you have a mapped over, this is a bivariate map where you have a mapped overheating risk and then some kind of measure of social deprivation. Um, it might be age, income, and so the idea with with Bayes at the time was that they could target overheating measures where there, a there was a high risk of overheating and b where 
there was quite high population vulnerability. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so to summary, all, all models are a representation of reality. Sometimes I like to say that they're all wrong, but some are useful. Uh, for housing stock population level models, statistical models, so the the indoor heat and air pollution model, it it can take time to build, but they're generally quicker to run. So when once you have built this framework, it's quick to run, but it, it, it took months to build. Um, yeah, it's generally quicker to run than building physics models. However, building physics models might sometimes better capture the underlying physical well generally better ca capture the underlying physical phenomena so things like thermal mass effect probably better accounted for in a building physics model also it's they're more flexible in terms of interventions so you like if you want to look at the effect of if you if you're using a statistical model and you want to try and see You've got this model that predicts an indoor temperature and it's it's a regression. This is a bit like the indoor heat model. You can't just go, okay, let's see what it looks like if we put shutters on this regression. Like it has to be some kind of value you can tweak in that regression. So it, in, in my experience, they're not as flexible in terms of the interventions, whereas in a biz, building physics model, you can... In, you can go in energy plus and see what the effect is if you put like external shutters on this window um there's some trade-offs between the kind of temporal resolution and the sample size so the, the personal exposure model um it's it varies in you can look at how childhood exposure varies in 10 minute intervals but that's a weighted sample so you can't look so that's got i think like five thousand unique individuals that's weighted to represent 1.3 million um whereas the this statistical model actually has 17.5 million rows of data and i don't you wouldn't be able to get time series data for that the, the data sets would just be enormous um so you have that to consider uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, the personal exposure framework just got published like last week. So if anyone is interested in reading more details, that's out there now. Uh, next slide, I think that's me. Yes, thank you for listening. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions at the mm -hmm. email address now or now or after. Thank you, Lauren. Very, very interesting. Um, I'm going to give you a, a virtual clap there. Um, uh, thank you. So are, are, there, are there any questions? Let me just Sorry. take a look. Are there any? Chris and, put one in the chat. Um, personal exposure model, indoor sources of PM2.5. Uh, why are these lower in least deprived? Do they have lower indoor emissions? Indoor emissions are better ways of dealing with sources. Um, so for the, in I think I know which figure Chris is talking about. Is it the one that's like horizontal, Chris, like the, the box plots where it wasn't always linear? Um, Could we try to find the slide? Go. It's slide, it is slide 11. This one, um, no, no. Yeah. One further, one further. Oh. The other way. It's like got, it's, and again, and one more. Yes, yeah, that one, this one. So this one, in the winter weekdays, the reason why, so the, the results were quite biased by the, the time activity data in that if if one of if the time activity data so if like and that some of the sample site once you start disaggregating the time activity 
sample. So we had variable. I didn't talk about this too much, but it is in the paper. The time activity data was linked with the indoor microenvironment concentration um, by ink. So we disaggregated the time activity data by household income quintile um, and age. So they were quite specific um, activity profiles for each household. Uh, and in that in that figure on winter weekdays, something was just going on because the indoor microenvironment concentrations were basically always like linear in that have you always seen a, a lower income homes had higher concentrations? It was when it gets weighted by the time activity data that you've seen this situation on winter weekdays where those from higher higher um deprived homes had lower concentration. I think usually this is the school generally had lower concentrations, the school environment than the than the home. So if more people, if more children had reported in that in that specific population group that they were at the school on that on this winter weekday, then the school the home concentration is weighted less and you get this kind of pattern that you see here. So it's it's to do with the time activity data. Because in the if you look in the paper, the the indoor microenvironment, the indoor and outdoor microenvironment concentrations alone are generally generally linear. It's when they get weighted that you get this kind of pattern. Um Chris, you have got a follow up question i think do you want to mute, the, unmute yourself Might be would that be the same for the least deprived summer weekdays their exposure is very low yeah so in um the least deprived summer weekdays they the outdoor concentrations were lower on yeah in summer and so when they're in the school they they just they generally have I think it was I don't it looks probably lower than it is I think it's about eight or six um so yeah it's it's because it's they're being weighted by the the in the low in the high in the least deprived they're reporting that they're at the school and the co the school concentration in summer is lower than uh, the home. Um, can I can I ask a, a related question? So you you mentioned yeah. that the children from the most deprived groups have the highest exposure, um, and and you also suggested that was that was due to the home. Is 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 that correct? That was the the primary contributor. So so concentrations at home. Yes. Yeah, so on week on weekends, if you look at this on weekends. Um, yeah, it is. So it's especially, you see it, it's especially exposed, exposed on weekends because they spend more time at home, but it is the home that's driving these um, high concentrations. And in winter, you see higher concentrations because you haven't got the, the wind. So we used a temperature dependent window opening threshold. Um, I think it was, I can't remember what it was now, but when in winter when that threshold isn't breached the indoor concentrations build up yeah so so this might not be what you what you kind of looked at but is that primarily a, a problem with ventilation yeah so i think in in london homes there there was and in my phd i kind of looked at the infiltration underlying infiltration rates more kind of closely and it was just that the there's they're smaller homes and in some cases they're well in a lot of cases they're they're kind of a flat or an apartment over 50 percent of housing in london is a flat or an apartment so they're not getting that outdoor air exchange um so that was yeah, the, a big driver, especially on weekends and in winter, was that, 
yeah, living in these homes with like low background ventilation and indoor indoor sources of air pollution. Yeah, it might also be that that they keep windows closed because otherwise the heating air goes through the roof. Mm -hmm. um, definitely, definitely yeah. last winter. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, any other questions? Let's see. Um, so you can raise your hand or you can unmute your microphone. Um, so I've got one more question, which was a bit more technical. So, so you mentioned that in the second part, when you um, when you use some uh, machine learning techniques, um, yeah. You said that you did this whole kind of suite of of simulations with with Energy Plus. So can you just give give us kind of a little kind of taste of how many simulations did you do? So did you use all the eight archetypes that you had there, and then used mm -hmm. randomized parameter values? How how did you do that? Yeah. So for so you had the eight archetypes, and the we have two. So for any categorical input you have to run a different like set of simulations so you have these eight archetypes that are fixed and then two wall types so whether or not it's it's solid or a cavity wall okay. so then for each weather file you have to run yeah so then and, and then all the other parameters are numerical and they're kind of sampled according to this distribution so i ran 600 for each combination of wall and wall and um building type and you run them for an entire year i assume yeah but the when you aggregate the results you just get an, an aggregate it's a static model like you just get a what one metric um, for for the year, the average per year, or whatever. Yeah, so you, you you might look at so you get a cooling or heating annual energy use, or we also calculated the the number of annual hours the bedroom temperature exceeds this kind of threshold, um, because you you just can't really get kind of time activity info into those kind of huge models. Sure. Um, but yeah, so six hundred energy plus simulations for each dwelling and wall type. I actually never worked out how That's, many individual so simulations a day. Times yeah, eight but archetypes I, times two wall types. Yeah. That's a lot of simulations. I also had two weather files as well. It was it was <laughs> okay. a lot Not of bad, work. But they yeah. were batch simulated and batch um generated. So like the Yeah. I wasn't like making the individual input files myself. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So that it's it's kind of ideally parallelizable. So this cluster must have gone in really handy. Yeah, that did a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna miss that. And now I'm not there. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, they got very nice uh, supercomputers in the US. So I'm sure yeah, you can extreme. find one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Any other questions? Just have a look. Uh, any other 